Yeah. So good afternoon, everyone in this audience. I know there are still people who want to come in, but uh, thank you for the interest. My panel here uh, is discussing in 45 minutes the future of knowledge. And as we have heard already this morning, we live probably at a historic moment in time where there has never been as many educated people before in the history of humankind. We have heard about the exponential growth of knowledge and the related technologies that come with it. We have heard enough about knowledge society, knowledge economy, knowledge being the precious resource that will decide the future. So what I would like uh, to start out with <clears throat> is to ask uh, Randy Schechtman here on our panel, how do you see this enormous potential that the future of knowledge has in terms of making it available, accessible, and what else you see as possible barriers in making full use of this enormous potential? Randy. Thank you. Thank you, Helga. Um, I, I accept the notion <clears throat> that knowledge will increase exponentially, as uh, we heard with technology, as Ray described so beautifully this morning. Um, but I'm very concerned about the access to that knowledge and the misuse or misrepresentation of that knowledge. The internet is a powerful force for good, but there's also a lot of rubbish out there that people believe and embrace. There is a digital and economic divide that prevents people from having access to scientific literature, to knowledge, and even more pervasively, I fear, there is a barrier to the acceptance of knowledge that uh, has, uh, is to the detriment of uh, the benefit to society. Uh, you only have to look at the current election that's going on in the US to see the misrepresentation of science and of knowledge that has taken hold in a substantial fraction of the American population. Indeed, this is a worldwide problem. Climate change, evolution, these are based on scientific observations and facts and conclusions, and yet they are denied by people who should otherwise have access to that knowledge. I'm also very concerned, let me just make this one more point. I'm also very concerned at the, at the high end that affects people here in this room uh, of commercial influences that prevent access to the most important scientific literature. You are all taxpayers in one or another country, and yet we find in very powerful commercial uh, scientific journals that you are prevented from having access to uh, research that is held behind a firewall uh, that you cannot have access to even if you're prepared uh, to uh, receive and understand it. I feel very strongly about the open access availability of scientific literature in particular. So even among the very intelligent, most intelligent people, there are barriers to access uh, of knowledge. Randy, thank you very much for making these strong points. Now, with regard to open access, we have seen there is a movement that started within the scientific community. So one can be somewhat more optimistic that this might be tackled in the right way. But the points you made earlier about people having access, what do you foresee as, you know, possibilities of making the knowledge available and acceptable in the sense that you talked about? Well, I'm, uh, I'm frankly dis disappointed and a little pessimistic. Um, uh, uh, the, the principles, I'll take mm. an example that I'm most familiar with, the principles of biological evolution. Have, have been understood by scientists for over 100 years and yet continue to be denied by people who base their, their views on uh, political or religious uh, principles that have no foundation in, in science. Now, how, can one, how can one deal with that level of access to knowledge and yet denial of knowledge? Well, uh, just uh, as, a, as a response, we see there's a difference between the US and Europe in this regard. Yeah. 
but not in respect to climate change. There still is uh, that active denial in climate change. <laughs> <laughs> or in the use of genetically modified organisms. That's, that's true, that's true. It varies, and I think there are structured reasons why it varies. For instance, in the US, the curricula are set by the local school authorities, while in European countries, it's usually a state uh, authority that decides on the curriculum. So these are, these are reasons that we don't want to go into now. But <clears throat> in principle, I think you have laid it out very well, and we will, I think, come back uh, to it. Let me now turn to, to Ray for an initial um, sort of statement. Uh, Ray, as an inventor and as a visionary, you have um, access both to the knowledge that is produced within academia, within research institutions of various kinds, but you have also access to this very large crowd of young people out there somewhere who use whatever technologies available with startups and, you know, who think the world is theirs. So how do you see the future of knowledge evolving um, Will academia remain the same? Will the walls crumble? Will the walls become much more porous as they are now? What kind of future do you foresee for these many enthusiastic young people out there who want to contribute and, you know, turn the knowledge into something that they can even make their livelihood of? <coughs> well, I think you answered some of the question uh, no, 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 with not your yours. question. <laughs> <Not> but, <yours. laughs> um, uh, let me respond to uh, the comments that we have heard. Uh, I, I think there's definitely valid issues, and I'm also concerned about people who deny obvious scientific uh, propositions for which there's a tremendous amount of evidence. However, that, that has its roots going way back. I mean, when Darwin introduced his thesis, it was very much a minority position, and uh, the scientific community uh, along with everyone else, uh, ridiculed evolution as being preposterous. Uh, so we still see a strong influence of, shall we call, traditional ideas about how the different species arrived here, but uh, I think the influence of science has grown. And I wouldn't say there's a have-have-not divide. I mean, the act, people say, well, only the wealthy can have access to these technologies that we talk about, or that I talk about, and I say, yeah, like smartphones, where in fact you had to be wealthy 20 years ago. If someone took out a mobile phone in a movie, that was a signal that this was a member of the power elite, and they didn't take it out of their pocket because it was big and, and heavy, uh, and it actually didn't work. So only the wealthy have access to these technologies at a point in time where they don't work. By the time they work well, uh, they're extremely inexpensive. We have two billion smartphones, you know, a kid in Africa with a smartphone has access to all of human knowledge. It's a trillion dollars of computation and communication circa 1970. Uh, so because of the 50% deflation rate in information technology, we put some of that improved price performance into price, so prices come down and put some of it into performance, so performance goes up. That's why you can buy an iPhone or an Android phone that's twice as good as the one two years ago for half the price. Uh, and ultimately, these technologies become very widespread. Uh, so I saw the, I mentioned that I saw some of these technologies emerging in the early 80s, and I was trying to find a way to time inventions and look for technology trends, and I saw the ARPANET uh, growing exponentially, but it was on, not on anywhere, anybody's radar. It was 500 people in 1980, and then it was 1,000, and then it was 2,000. I did the simple math and said, whoa, this is going to be a, World Wide Web, uh, by the late 90s, connecting hundreds of millions of people. We won't be able to find anything without search engines, or we'll need search engines. And did some more calculations and saw the computation and communication resources needed to create a search engine would be in place. Uh, and then we heard from Guru uh, about systems like Watson that can actually help us organize the knowledge. We do have an explosion of knowledge, depending on how you measure it, it's doubling every year or two years. And, uh, you know, an oncologist who specializes in a fairly narrow area cannot read every article on oncology because there's tens of thousands of them. So we need systems like Watson, which are emerging, that can actually read natural language. Not as good as humans, but they make up for that lack of reading uh, ability 
through scale, through reading, you know, millions of pages. Watson read 200 million pages when, in order to play Jeopardy, and didn't understand it that well. It might read one page and, and conclude, ah, there's a 56% chance that Barack Obama is president of the United States. You might read that page, and if you didn't happen to know that ahead of time, conclude there's a 98% chance. So you did a better job than Watson at reading that page. So why is it that Watson defeated the best two human players combined? Well, it made up for its weak reading by reading more pages. It read 200 million pages. You know, I get stuck at 100 million pages. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, or more like 100 so in, pages. In, in, so. which, in which way will this transform also the relationship between... Well, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's the merger of the human idea. and machine. Mm. These machines are helping us to deal with this explosion of knowledge and find the right knowledge that's relevant to the situation. So there are assistants and they're becoming more and more sophisticated so we can focus on the broader picture, uh, look at issues of common sense and reasoning that computers can't manage yet. Uh, but they're helping us to organize this tremendous explosion of knowledge. But I would not say that people don't have access to it. It's just too much for us to absorb. So we need these computerized assistants to help us understand okay. the knowledge. Okay. I now turn to, to, to Joel. Uh, my question to you is, you know, we somehow take it for granted that we know how knowledge is being produced. Because we have grown up with it, we see what is happening now, we are immersed in that. And yet, when we go back in the history of knowledge production and in the history of science, we see this is not to be taken for granted. But rather, there were specific conditions, and in particular in Europe, and this is a debate that has been going on among historians for a long time, you know, why did modern science arise in Europe and not in China, although the Chinese were well developed in some areas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, it's one of these questions that you cannot answer definitely, but you can circumscribe, you know, what are some of the conditions that were necessary which leads us then to the question, what is necessary today? But first, let's have a, a quick look back to history. Quick. <laughs> and since I know <laughs> how hard it is. It is um, hard. It is hard. But let, so let, 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 jo Joel has just written a book on this, but I, know. I asked him not Actually, to. Actually, three books, but I'll give you, I'll give you one. Uh, but let me, let, me make, let me make a very brief point which I think will resonate with this audience. And that is, we've been talking a great deal about artificial intelligence this morning. I want to introduce a slightly different but very closely related concept called artificial revelation. This is a term in, introduced by uh, uh, the late Nate Rosenberg, who passed away a few months ago. And what artificial revelation basically mm. tells you is that in order to understand nature, uh, we are very limited if we rely on our senses alone, right? So our vision and our hearing and our computational abilities are all limited by human evolution and there's just so much we can do. But what we can do is we can reveal things to us artificially by creating tools that allow us to see those things that nature didn't mean us to see. And so we build telescopes, we build microscopes to see things that we normally uh, wouldn't be able to see. We create vacuum pumps, and now we have to create uh, computers that allow us to do computations that nature didn't mean us to make because our brains are limited, but we can fool nature by doing things that nature didn't want us to do. The great breakthroughs that we associate with the work of people like Galileo and Newton in the 17th century were in fact made possible by these inventions and by others like the barometer and the thermometer and the vacuum pump and a whole sort of set of tools that were made possible that made for this breakthrough. And every time you see a, a big breakthrough in science, uh, the first question you should ask is what were the instrument and the tools behind it? Now you ask yourself, where are we today? And what do we have? We have available you know, microscopes and telescopes and computing machines that look that that would make anything that Louis Pasteur had, you know, look like child's play. And so we have vastly increased the power of us not just to control nature, but to ask questions and to get them answered. And that I think means that we're really at a um, at a crossroads. And that's why I said this morning, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because, mm -hmm. you know, wonderful, you know, Pasteur had a wonderful microscope and Galileo had a principal telescope. But compared with 
what Galileo had with the Hubble telescope. And you realize, you know, how much more we can do. And so I foresee science actually taking an incredible leap forward in the next 20 years. And once science does that, the implications for human technology are, you know, unimaginable. That said, I'm not clear that that is the good news or the bad news. Because we give people a lot more power, we give people a lot more leverage. It can be used for the good, it can be used for the bad. That depends on what we do with it. And here's one final reflection. The late Douglas North, the great economic historian who passed away, Nobel Prize winner who passed away last month, once told me, he said, Joel, you know, something interesting. In technology, we talk about technological progress, which has some kind of implication mm -hmm. of monotonicity, right? That we're mm -hmm. going forward. As far as institutions are concerned, we talk about institutional change. There is no concept of progress. It may be go get better, it may get worse. The last 10 years, I'm afraid, in many places, things have not gotten better. That growing gap between our capability to do things and our institutions mm. to guide us to do the right thing, that growing gap causes me to stay awake at night. Uh -huh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> We come back to that. David, um, I think it is fair to say when we speak about knowledge, it always is knowledge for what? S knowledge for something. There is no abstract knowledge which just rests uh, per se. Now you as uh, someone who has closely seen what markets pick up, what markets don't pick up, how do you foresee the future development in terms of what Joy just said, you know, there will be this explosion, if we believe you, this explosion, and I think in terms of potential possibilities, you are certainly right. But what kind, and the market is some kind of institution, are the markets ready for this? How will the market perform? What else is necessary in terms of regulation? What is the role of the state? Big question to you, David. Those are big questions. <laughs> uh, the, I think the thing to bear in mind, uh, knowledge is a, is a static, it's a, it's a body of, of techniques and expertise, but, but knowledge has to be applied. Simply disseminating knowledge doesn't actually get you very far. If, if, it, was just, you know, if it was just about dissemination, public libraries would have made the, the, rich, the developed world you know, infinitely educated a long time ago. Uh, knowledge needs to be taught, and then it needs to be applied to specific problems. And that's where markets become central. Uh, innovation is, a, is an fundamentally an economic activity largely driven by profit. And a lot of the technologies we see are a function of the profit motive. They don't just fall out of the sky. Going back to the discussion uh, at the prior panel, there's a reason we have drugs for uh, erectile dysfunction, Viagra, and don't have anti-malarial drugs. And it's not because erectile dysfunction was an easier problem. It's because the people who have erectile dysfunction uh, are wealthy. Uh, and these are problems of the rich world. And uh, there's a huge market. An enormous human need would be solved by developing anti-malarials. But the people who would benefit can't really pay for it. Uh, and so part of the uh, interaction between all this knowledge and technology we have and the market is designing incentives such that the right problems are solved, right? So we spend, you know, enormous amount of technology goes into consumer goods that have actually very little practical value. I was at a panel recently and someone said, you know, as trying to give an example of disruptive uh, rate of change, he said, there is more computer processing power in your Maytag washing machine than the entire Apollo moon program. And I thought, well, that's the law of diminishing marginal returns. You know, it's worthless applied to something where it does no good. My washing machine is not going to the moon, right? That's a, you know, kind of a misapplication. Why? Well, wealthy people buy Maytag washing machines. That same set of technologies could be applied to solve real problems in the developing world. If, if we stop technological progress right now and just caught up the rest of the world where we are, that would create more human benefit than the, the series of innovations we're likely to experience over the next 30 years uh, that are not going to be distributed evenly at all. So, the, the, and so let me try to make a practical point. Uh, governments and institutions have a real role in shaping these incentives. So for example, the Gates Foundation has set up a challenge for creating anti-malarial drugs. Uh, and because of that incentive, those drugs are now being developed. When DARPA does its grand challenges in robotics or in vehicle driving, they're trying to do these, uh, create a market where one is missing 
to cause people to apply knowledge to create technologies to solve problems. So the technologies that we will see are not just a matter of what happens Eureka-like in the lab. They're a function of what people perceive to be the profits and benefits, and we can shape those. That's a, a societal and a governmental and an institutional choice. But to, this brings me back to open access. I mean, there you have a market of publishers who are out for profit. At the same time, researchers complain, and the taxpayers should also complain. Why are we funding research twice? By Do you want to react yeah, yeah. to this, yeah. uh, Randy? Well, it's a very serious mm -hmm. problem, one that I take on myself directly. Um, there are very strong commercial influences. Uh, Elsevier is the largest publisher of scientific literature in the world. They have taken a very active role in opposing open access uh, in Europe and in the US. They oppose legislation mandating that scientists publish their work in open access journals. Uh, it's a problem. Uh, how, how, to, how to deal with it uh, is a very, very serious one that, that I spend a lot of time on. Um, uh, the problem is that uh, publishers like, like Elsevier, Nature Publishing Group, uh, encourage uh, the publication of um, sensational observations. I'll give you an example. Last year, uh, Nature published a paper, two papers, uh, that claim that you could take adult human cells and expose them to low pH and turn them into human embryonic stem cells. This was uh, made the evening news, the front page of the Wall Street Journal, the New York, New York Times. Uh, it was fraud, it was manipulation. Uh, the first author was uh, humiliated from the experience. The, 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 one of the senior authors committed suicide as a result of the, his humiliation. This was, I argue, uh, from perhaps a minority point of view, I argue, uh, direct directly the result of the commercial influence where uh, journals that are hidden behind firewalls uh, try to sensationalize work and encourage people to misrepresent science. That has had, I think, a dramatic effect on the public acceptance of science. In the US, we've learned from pharmaceutical companies that much of the research that's published in journals like, like Nature uh, is not reproducible. Uh, it does not lead to the development of drugs uh, as predicted by these papers. These, the, the, this is influenced by the pressures that commercial publishers place on young investigators to hype up their work. This leads, to, I, I would say, to very damaging effects on the public acceptance of science. So uh, although I am generally a Pollyanna about progress in science and intelligence, it will, it will rise, we will solve these problems. There, there is a very serious problem with the public acceptance of science. Ray said earlier that um, Darwin had opponents when his theories were first um, published. Of course, all revolutionary theories engender uh, opposition, but uh, there, there, I haven't seen any opposition to the theory of, of, uh, of gravity uh, or much opposition to the theory of relativity. There, there is opposition to science when it, uh, when it, uh, it, it it touches personal and sometimes tribal points of view. And the, uh, I, I'm very concerned about the public acceptance of science, uh, that, that it's actually increased, the, the, um, uh, the, that uh, the disbelief in scientific achievement uh, has increased in recent years. It used to be in the US, the progress in science was uh, the foundation of, of the future. Now. Um, people can, uh, can blame scientists for all kinds of things and deny science. And it's not just in the US, it's worldwide. Yeah. So I'm very but, concerned but, about but this. But this gets us back to the point that uh, Joel made about institutions. I mean, we see worldwide that the trust uh, of the public, the general public, in institutions of any kind mm -hmm. goes down. Science is still relatively better than other uh, institutions, in particular the trust of politicians is going down dramatically. So this poses a question, do we have the right kind of institutions? What is causing this loss of legitimacy of uh, the institutions we have? And what can science do? Are we caught in the middle somewhere there? Or, um, <clears throat> you know, what can science do to, to uh, <coughs> get it right and uh, make for public acceptance there where science should be accepted.
I'd just Any like a, a point about you? a slightly different issue to respond to something said earlier that the world is getting worse in the last 10 years, that really it's not consistent with any parameters you might attach to that. The World Bank recently reported that poverty in Asia over the last 15 years has been cut by something like 90 percent uh, because of moving from agrarian economies to information economies. Uh, we're certainly making progress in diseases. Biotechnology now has various fruits. You can now fix a broken heart, not yet from romance. That'll take more <laughs> development of virtual reality. But, you know, from, uh, it come. <laughs> from, from a damaged uh, output of the heart, you can now uh, begin to repair that. I mean, there's many different examples of how we are making progress uh, in health. And, uh, but we're also making progress in reporting on what's wrong with the world. Right. So there's a battle halfway around the world. We not only hear about it, we experience it viscerally. I think that's a good thing because it leads us to pay attention to these problems, but it leads to the perception that things are getting worse because our information about what's getting worse is getting better. No, I think in every age you have to realize uh, a crisis is always momentous. And it happens now in the present, and it's very difficult to compare it also what people were afraid of in previous times. It, it changes uh, quite dramatically. And uh, if you say we now have more information of what happens, but we also have a feeling that there is less distance. We have the feeling we have only this planet, if you think of uh, climate change. So uh, something has happened in terms of not just globalization as an economic phenomenon, but also in terms of awareness uh, that we well, terms, do have. In terms of the environment, solar energy is doubling right. every two years. It's now at a point, it's about 2%, so it's only about six doublings. Uh, we have 10,000 times more sunlight than we need. So, I mean, there are, there's mm -hmm. progress, but it's not reported yeah. as much. People yeah. are much more interested but, in it. But the question is not so much, you know, I, I believe we all here share there has been progress that has been made. At the same time, we also raise our ambition. We want more progress to be achieved. We want this progress to be shared more equally uh, around the globe, uh, to have, let people have access to it that don't, etc. So also something is changing in our ethos. Um, yeah. No, I want to make a point that almost every major breakthrough, particularly in information technology, is really a double-edged sword. And we better keep in mind that we cannot really talk about it just being good or being bad. And let me give you sort of the, the mother of all examples, which is the invention of the printing press in the middle of the 15th century. Now, in many ways, the printing press had a hugely positive effect in terms of access to knowledge, to increase in literacy, and so on. But we should keep in mind that the printing press also caused a major disaster in Europe, and that is the printing press was in, in, instrumental in bringing about the Reformation, and the Reformation led to about 150 years of major internecine wars in Europe, in which people both read the same book, had different interpretations, and went to kill each other over it, you know? And to some extent, that is a little bit what's happening today. We see these sort of ideologically uh, driven wars by people who actually have access to information, but they read uh, the wrong things, or they read the same things and give it different interpretations. And so then you ask me, well, do you think printing, you know, printing press was in all balance a good e example? And I have a good counter example then, because we know, do know that there was, in the Islamic world, in which was mostly the Ottoman Empire at the time, actually there was a prohibition on printing presses. And so between 1450, when the first printing press appeared in Europe, and about 1720, it's the earliest we know. Books were printed in Europe in every language, in, in, in Roman letters, in Cyrillic letters, in Hebrew letters, in Greek letters. They were not printed in Arabic or in Turkic letters because that was not allowed. And so 300 years, the Islamic world lived uh, without having access to the printing press. And so you ask yourself, well, uh, do you think that has any implications for our own time? And you know, I'm not going to answer that question. You all should think about this. <laughs> but clearly, the alternative to not doing it was worse than the alternative to doing it. But we also should keep in, in mind that there was a very high price to be paid for this progress. 
but uh, you cannot blame the printing press. I do not blame the printing press for anything. <laughs> it's people. It, no, it, it is people. people. But, but mm. the printing press mm. basically and played Abel. the role mm. that, you know, that the internet or computers or, you know, play today. It's a medium. It's what we make of it. Well, and we want to... Uh, so you're saying, you know, it's... Um, if we leave out ideas, if we leave out meanings that people attach to what is a life that they aspire to, you know, and this is a question that I think we have to ask ourselves again and again, because in some way we are immersed in many wonderful technological imaginaries, uh, not just uh, science fiction of an old kind, but something that seems so very close. And yet we very often don't have an idea what is the kind of society we would need uh, to make this fully realizable. So uh, I'm saying there is a asymmetry between the technological imaginaries we have and the imaginaries about a society that we would like to have and want to live that, in. I think there's much more consensus than maybe apparent because again the media likes to focus on disagreements and <clears throat> but the idea that we want democracy, liberty, ideas of freedom, it's pretty universal. I mean, it certainly can very quickly point to societies and nations that don't practice these in ways that we find ideal. But that was not the case 100 mm. years ago. You could count the number of democracies on the fingers of one hand a century ago. I think the increase of communication uh, with the printing press brought about a few democracies and then television, radio, and computers have really accelerated that trend. It's now at least the norm. People aspire to that and they claim to be uh, democratic and have freedoms and, and there's a lot of focus on where it's not true, but it, it, there is kind of a consensus, I think, on these values. I mean, there's some very notable exceptions and we struggle with those. And I'm not saying we've reached perfection, but there is much more of a consensus on how we should conduct human affairs than there was a century ago. David, you were shaking your head. Uh, well, <laughs> which is your no, right I, I agree do. with Ray at one level. There has been, a, you know, <laughs> democracy actually is uh, is good for societal satisfaction. It's good for economic growth. It's good for distribution. There are many good things that come through democracy. It's, it's not apparent that, uh, and democracy has become much more prevalent than it used to be. Yeah, it's, good it's not apparent, and it's good for peace. It's not apparent that every society, when it has a revolution, immediately chooses democracy as its form of government. Um, but uh, I was going to say, uh, you know, more broadly. You know, there was a time in human history when, when there was genuine scarcity. There was not enough food, there was not enough shelter, uh, there was, you know, not medication and so on. We live in a time when there, we have actually fantastic abundance and it's really a question of institutions and distribution. Uh, there's no question that, uh, you know, that much of the world could be and should be wealthier than it is and it's misgovernance that prevents it from be, being so, not a lack of technology. And similarly, even when there is abundance, it doesn't actually necessarily lead to, uh, you know, good outcomes. So you could take, you know, take two countries that have enormous resource abundance, uh, Norway and uh, Saudi Arabia, right? Both have huge oil wealth. Uh, and yet those, those countries, uh, despite this, you know, just incredible access to material resources have managed that completely differently. And in Norway, we have, it's a very inclusive country. Almost everybody works, even though in theory they wouldn't have to. They don't, they have long, they have vacations, health benefits, and things that Americans only uh, uh, either dream about or apparently don't want. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it's, a, it's a society that invests in its people and that people feel uh, identified with the institutions. Then you look at Saudi Arabia, a country that has also has enormous wealth. And, uh, you know, 90% of the private sector workforce in Saudi Arabia are uh, 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 guest workers. Only 10% of the, the private sector workforce are Saudis. Uh, most of the Saudis who work, work for the government in uh, kind of uh, make work jobs that don't uh, produce a lot of societal value. And most of the educational resources are devoted to religious education rather than engineering education, which is what Saudi really needs. Um, but those are two examples of, you know, it's not the technology or the wealth per se or the abundance that determines the outcome. It's actually the, the institutions that manage that. And uh, I don't know how we get from here. I, you know, I, maybe Ray is right that, you know, that's just the natural tendency that will evolve towards democracy. But I think there are clearly forces pushing the other direction. Uh, and so the challenge, I think, is uh, to, you know, there's no question that we have opportunities and will have opportunities that are, you know, unimaginable a century ago. Uh, but that doesn't mean they will necessarily be used well. We need to figure out the institutions that will direct them towards those outcomes that we want. 
Okay. If I, if, I can add, if I can add to that, I think the one institution, we, and we heard this morning in one of the panels, one, the one institution that we must rely on more than any to uh, extend knowledge and the influence of knowledge is the educational system uh, around the world. Mm. Uh, until that advances and, um, and the best standards of education are applied in the developed and in the underdeveloped countries, then the, the, the rich knowledge that we're generating as scientists uh, will will not be heard, so that that um, that remains a challenge, a, a serious challenge. Yeah. 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 And we also see how <clears throat> the education of women, in particular, mm -hmm. has really changed and has been one of the um, main elements in being able to bring about a, a change. I'm wondering whether the audience that has patiently listened to us uh, now want to come up with a question or two, I think we can, there is a microphone I've been told, is it, is it true? Yes. So um, we can take uh, two or three questions. Well, we have no tweets to... Yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we have old fashioned questions, so please hear. <laughs> but please be short because we have to finish on time. <clears throat> okay, a short question here. Uh, the gentleman here to the right, I forgot your name, I'm f sorry about that. Uh, you talk about our knowledge extended by means of various scientific uh, explorations. We look deeper down into the universe and we look into smaller matters and we hear more and more and we can use our five senses uh, by means of technical achievements. But my question is, do you think that universe or our basic universe manifests itself only through means of our five senses. Isn't it quite natural that there must be ways where a universe is showing itself that we have new means, new senses to register, however deep we go into science? Okay. So the, the question no, I think I, was, was that your, was that your right or our right? No, I, think was, I think it was your right. I think, I think, I think, I'm, I think I'm for Joel. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm the victim. <laughs> anyway, even if it were for me, I think Joel but, should answer uh, that. <laughs> no, I mean, you, you're totally right. I mean, we keep discovering new things that uh, we never I thought existed and that we can't see. The best example is sort of the recent discoveries on dark matter which turns out there's six times more dark matter than matter that we can see, except we can't see dark matter. We can only infer its existence indirectly from very clever experiments that we carry mm -hmm. out. And uh, I'm totally convinced that, you know, a hundred years from now, we will know mm -hmm. things that at nobody in this world today even suspects to be true. Uh, and in some sense, that's what's so exciting, isn't it? I mean, we, we, we know we have things today that a hundred years ago people would never have imagined. And that's why this is all so exciting. And that's why we, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually still get, get as excited about this as I, as I ever did. Because, because the world is so infinitely complex and we're so small and we're just learning, we're just getting started. And, uh, I'm okay, so, you know, I, I have, I'm teaching in, in my class, I'm teaching them history of science, and it's always really good fun to sort of laugh at the, at the beliefs of people, you know, 200, 300 years ago, who believed that you could cure somebody who had, who had the cold by, by, you know, bleeding them and, you know, putting, a, 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 you know, a, 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 yes, right. And, 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 and all these sort of funny things, and my, my, my students have a good laugh at that, you know, these various... But then you tell them, you know, 20, in the year 2200, somebody's going to look at us, at our exercise machines, you know, and at our homeopathic medicine. And they will look at us as a bunch of prejudiced ignoramuses, you know. And so keep, in, keep some history, study of history, you know, it's in some ways should make you feel very modest. Uh, no, no. <laughs> So let, let me just add, you know, this is the great thing about uh, science. Every scientist knows that the knowledge we have now is provisional knowledge. It will be superseded, extended, complemented by other knowledge. And this indeed makes you humble. But at the same time, it gives you a lot of confidence that there will be others. And in particular, fundamental research is the way in which humanity is able to expand its, its knowledge. And we need institutions 
and politicians to understand that uh, apart from going to applied science, we also need to invest in this kind of fundamental science. One last question over there in the, in, in the middle, please, the lady. There was a lady there, I think. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Lena. Uh, excuse me if the question is a bit naive, but you talk about the gap between science and institutions. But institutions are actually nothing but a group of people who run. So the gap is between science and human beings. So where are we going to find these responsible, socially progressive, uh, collaborative, collective human beings to bridge the gap between science and you know, institutions? Well, I think what, <clears throat> one influence is the extent to which scientific knowledge and knowledge in general is widely available. So it used to be science could only be practiced and talked about by a small elite that understood a certain you know, private language and had access to that information. Uh, there's a tremendous, I mean, this, the problems that are brought up about scientific publishing, I think, are valid. But nonetheless, there's a, just an explosion of scientific knowledge which is out there, and we have tools to help us access it and interpret it. Uh, and lots of people are involved, and there's a concept of wisdom of crowds where you know, no one individual, including scientists, can actually understand the information, but you can actually have a crowd be wiser than any of its individuals, and occasionally we achieve that. There's also the wisdom of a lynch mob, which that's so good uh, wisdom of crowds, but uh, we do have an unprecedented access to scientific information. More and more people are able to get involved, and that, I think that does lead to uh, more appreciation of new knowledge. Just to very, very briefly, Randy was Sorry. first. Oh, sorry, no, go ahead. Mm. Sorry. Randy. Yeah, uh, great question, um, and it comes back to one thing that I said and has been said today, and that is that we, we must rely on the educational system to teach people who are in positions of influence uh, about what, the, what science is all about, what scientific principles are, how science is done, what a discovery means, how it's understood by scientists. In the US, there was one physicist who was a member of Congress. There are now no trained scientists in the, in the entire US Congress. They're all lawyers, or mostly all lawyers. Um, doctors. Some physicians, but, yeah. but not, but not <laughs> scientists, not trained scientists. <laughs> and um, I, I dare say that's true around the world. So uh, uh, it, it, it will depend uh, on our educational institutions uh, and you know, a willingness of people to accept science for what it is, which I, don't, which I frankly don't see now, and which very concerns me deeply. Okay. Yeah. Joanne? Yeah, so it's, I totally agree with what Randy said, but I want to throw in one more thing. Science depends on ideology because it's ideology that determines the, how well the institutions work. In the hands of a Hitler or a Stalin, science can be an awful thing. And I think uh, uh, Ray was saying something quite correctly, which is we implicitly, which is we are the fortunate heirs of an ideology that emerged in Europe in the age of enlightenment, uh, which gave us many of the values that still sustain us today. And as long as these values remain valid mm. for our society, you know, institutions, even though they sometimes tremble a little bit, they will continue to be what they are. What I really worry about is the undermining of that enlightened ideology, which we see happening right under our eyes. Yeah. I would like to. Uh, <laughs> I would like slightly like to rephrase what you said. I would not call it an ideology. I would call it a value, and the value on which science is based is the value of free inquiry, and this was hard fought for, and it meant people standing on the shoulders of giant way back there were standing up against the church and the state the absolute monarchy at the time when modern science came up in, in Europe. And this value of free inquiry is something very, very precious, and I think it needs to be preserved. And it needs institutions to protect it, institutions to cultivate and to nurture it. So thank you very much. Unfortunately, our time is up. The knowledge, uh, knowledge has a future, but we have to remain uh, vigorous, 
in defending the values on which it is based. Thank you very much.